Some number of years ago, I don't even remember exactly, maybe three or four years ago, um, we began uh, what to me is an important tradition for Wednesday lunch in which we invited somebody to come uh, and speak uh, either to review the Supreme Court term uh, or which, of course, we're always in the middle of or to discuss uh, serious legal issues that involved the highest court. And uh, because I'm a person in practice and not always reading all of the cases and not reading all of the law review articles, I know that's a shock. Um, although I, I, I did, Goodwin, read all of my, uh, all of my young scholars, um, it seemed to me that this was really an important thing to continue and so when I was thinking this year uh, about who we might have to address us that has had both wide experience in all areas of the law uh, and who would be uh, fascinating to listen to, I had had an opportunity to hear Judge Willie Fletcher, actually because of the young lawyers, speak in such interesting ways about all of the things we were reading and I wondered if I might be able to talk him into coming to address us today. He was so relieved, Goodwin, that I wasn't calling to ask him to be on the Young Lawyers Committee, <laughs> Scholars Committee, <laughs> that he agreed immediately, <laughs> immediately to come. And so I wanted to spend a moment or two uh, introducing everyone to uh, Judge Fletcher, in this case Judge Willie Fletcher, of the Ninth Circuit. Uh, he has had an amazing academic career that includes, of course, not only graduating with distinction as an undergraduate in a, uh, from law school, but he was a Rhodes Scholar. Uh, and he was a Rhodes Scholar at a time when that uh, included also having some athletic ability. But I've never asked him really what uh, exactly what that was. Maybe you can enlighten us uh, a little bit, Willie. Uh, he is uh, among those rare judges... Uh, of whom uh, our council member Diane Wood is one as well, who has remained a serious scholar and a serious teacher. And I can't think of anyone uh, whose words will be more important as we all get on our planes elevated by this entire meeting, uh, whose words will send us even better on the way than our last speaker. Please help me welcome from the Ninth Circuit and from the West Coast, uh, our friend Willie Fletcher. Roberta, thank you very much. Uh, you will soon learn the mistake that Roberta made in inviting me to address you. Uh, I debated what to talk about, but then the court made up my mind for me about a month ago when it decided McCutcheon. Uh, I will talk about the Supreme Court and campaign finance. I did not uh, plant it with Gerhardt yesterday, but uh, he cooperated and said campaign finance might be something to talk about. Congressman... Edward Keating quoted Justice Brandeis as saying, we may have democracy or we may have wealth concentrated in the hands of a few, but we can't have both. Now, Brandeis may or may not have said exactly those words. He certainly did not ever write exactly those words, but we do know from his writings that those sentiments were expressed by him in various ways. When Brandeis was confirmed to the court in 1916, after a bitter fight, I might add, the distribution of income and wealth in this country was heavily skewed to the rich in very much the same percentages as today. In Brandeis' day, the top 1% had 19.5% of the nation's income. Today, the top 1% has 22.5% of the nation's income. In Brandeis' day, the top 1% had 38% of the nation's wealth. Today, the top 1% has 34%. And today, the disparities are increasing. As the disparities increase, the ability of today's wealthy, in the wake particularly of Citizens United, decided four years ago, and McCutcheon decided last month, 
to influence elections through campaign contributions has greatly increased. To give you just one set of numbers, and I could give you many, but just to give you one set, in the wake of Citizens United, which held unconstitutional any limitation on the amount a corporation could contribute in independent expenditures, in the wake of Citizens United, so-called independent, I do say so-called, independent expenditures increased in presidential elections by 245%, in House elections by 662%, in Senate elections by 1,338%. I share Justice Brandeis' view that our democracy is threatened as the increasingly wealthy are increasingly able to spend large amounts of money, sometimes unlimited amounts of money, to influence political results. How has this happened? How have we come to this pass? I will try to explain it by looking at the two major structural election cases decided by the Supreme Court in the last 50 years. Baker versus Carr, 1962. Buckley versus Vallejo, 1976. I put to one side Bush versus Gore. It is not, in my view, a structural case. It was indeed self-described, perhaps I should say self-confessed, as a ticket for this day and train only, a case addressing a particular situation and designed to achieve a particular result. So back to the two cases with which I will be concerned. First, Baker versus Carr. In Baker versus Carr, the justices were confronted with a serious and real-world problem our own American homegrown rotten borough system. In the years following the Civil War, there had been a steady migration from the countryside to the cities. But there had not been a commensurate redrawing of the lines of the electoral districts. And as the cities became more and more crowded, the countryside more and more emptied out, and the lines not redrawn, the rural districts came to have disproportionate, sometimes severely disproportionate, influence over politics. In the particular case in front of the court in Baker versus Carr, the malapportionment in Tennessee, 37% of the voters elected 63% of the state representatives, 40% of the voters elected uh, uh, 60 some, no, excuse me, 32, 37% elected 60 in the House, 40% elected 63% of the state, state senators. And this pattern was replicated across the entire country. Because of the very nature of the problem, political solution to the problem was going to be very difficult. The English rotten borough system was finally reformed by Parliament in 1832 but only when the English perceived a very real threat of revolution comparable to what was being threatened at that time on the continent. So the justices understood that if this problem was going to be, be resolved, it likely had to be done by the justices. There had been a long lead-up to this, not only in the sense of this migration, but in the sense of the case law. The Supreme Court had previously addressed this question in Cold Grove versus Green in 1946, and had declined to address it, calling it a political question. They had addressed it in the case of racial gerrymandering in Gomillion versus Lightfoot and made an exception, we're going to get rid of racial gerrymanders. But not until 1962, finally, does the court say that malapportionment is not a political question. Justice Frankfurter dissents, saying the court should not enter into the political thicket. On that court, there was some genuine political sophistication among the justices. Chief Justice Warren, of course, had served as governor of California, and Justice Black had, for a number of years, served as senator from Alabama. So the court had some sense of the stakes and some sense of what it was doing. It announced one person, one vote as the principal two years later in Reynolds versus Sims, but everyone knew in 1962 at the time Baker decided 
that one person, one vote was going to be the governing principle. There is an essential inevitability of simplification when judges make rules as distinct from legislature, legislature as passing statutes because our very sense of legitimacy of judicial decision-making is that it must be principled. Therefore, we end up with an almost necessary simplification of the law governing malapportionment when the Supreme Court steps in because it gives us this principle, one person, one vote, as to which all other principles must either give way or come in after that principle has been satisfied. And the justices thought it was worth it. I think in the long run it probably has been worth it, but I want to point out that Baker versus Carr has come with significant costs, I think not all of them readily foreseeable by the justices at the time. The political scientists saw them fairly early, some of the practicing politicians saw them very early, but I'm not sure even they could have foreseen them fully. The primary and most immediately obvious consequence is you need to reapportion every 10 years with the census. Well, reapportionment means opportunities for gerrymandering. And of course, we got gerrymandering in every state every 10 years. Gerrymandering does two things. The most obvious is that it advantages the party in power who gerrymand to their own advantage. The second, almost as obvious, but not quite, is that gerrymandering tends to create safe seats. Safe seats have a very interesting and, to my mind, bad consequence because if you are in a safe district and a Democrat, your threat is always at the primary and always from your left. If you are in a safe Republican seat, it's the converse. Your threat at the primary is always going to come from the right, which means then that we will necessarily get increased polarization in our politics. So we end up with safe seats, and we end up with Democrats and Republicans who are fearful of their radical wings, which makes compromise among those elected representatives more difficult. We have also got uh, term limits. Term limits are a consequence of the safe seats that were created. And in the end, we end up with, I think, a slightly better world than the world with which we began in 1962, but not a greatly better world when we realize the, ex the various consequences that have flowed from the implementation of one person, one vote. I don't think I would go back to the pre-1962 world, but I would see Baker versus Carr as a cautionary tale rather than an inspirational tale. Fourteen years later, we got Buckley versus Vallejo. Like Baker versus Carr, Buckley was a break from the past, but it was a much more radical break from the past than we saw in Baker, both procedurally and substantively. Procedurally, or perhaps I should say jurisdictionally, I will start in 1793. In 1793, then Secretary of State Jefferson wrote a letter to the justices of the United States Supreme Court asking 29 numbered questions. The Washington administration was concerned about what it should do as a neutral power during the Napoleonic Wars. It did not want to create any unnecessary enemies, and there were a number of complicated legal questions about vessels coming into American ports. And Jefferson wrote to the highest court in the land to get the most authoritative answer he could get. The justices responded, we cannot answer the questions presented in that form. Today, we would say they weren't presented as cases or controversies. They, in the old days, would have said it exceeds the judicial power. And they said, it is a forbidden advisory opinion that you ask of us. Almost 200 years later, in 1974, the Senate was debating a campaign finance bill in the wake of the Watergate scandals. President Nixon would resign in August. These were conversations in the Senate in June of 1974. 
The Senate had in front of it a bill that would substantially limit the ability both to contribute to particular candidates and to make independent expenditures on behalf of particular issues or candidates. There were obviously some constitutional problems that would show up if you limit expenditures for political campaigns. Senator James Buckley of New York was concerned not only about those questions, but concerned about the ability to get the bill passed because of the hesitation many of the senators were having about those questions. So he proposed an amendment. The amendment provided, and was almost immediately accepted, that anyone eligible to vote for president could challenge any provision of the newly adopted Campaign Finance Act, that was adopted later that year in 74, on any constitutional ground. With that amendment added, the act passed, was signed into law, and Senator Buckley brought suit <laughs> as an individual eligible to vote for president in the case called Buckley versus Vallejo. The amendment provided not only this broad grant of standing, but also an accelerated procedure for the case to be heard. The suit was filed in the District Court for the District of Columbia. The District Court certified directly to the United States Supreme Court 22 questions without deciding any of them. The United States Supreme Court accepted the certified questions. It heard argument in early November 1976. It issued a per curiam decision in late January, excuse me, heard argument November 1975, issued a per curiam decision at the end of January in 1976, answering, I think, only 21 of the 22 questions. I couldn't find the answer to question 7E when I read the opinion. <laughs> in intent and consequence, I regard Senator Buckley's amendment and lawsuit as the equivalent of the letter sent by, Senate, by Thomas Jefferson to the Supreme Court. It was a request for advice. The Supreme Court gave the advice. It gave it in a hurried manner. It gave it in all of the circumstances one has counseled against over and over again in the legal process school. What judges are good at is answering discrete questions with real-world problems, with lawyers who have argued back and forth. The Supreme Court is particularly good at answering questions that have been percolating through the lower courts. Lower courts might have given different answers. The Supreme Court's educated by those answers and come at it. Here we have, in a very, very short compass, a time of not quite three months from argument to final opinion. They hurried to get it out in time for the election season for 1976. Answers to questions that the court in 1793 would certainly not have answered if they had been posed in a letter, for example, from the Senate Majority Leader. And I think we are bearing the cost today of that hurried procedure and of the answer that we get. Substantively, it was a break from the past in that the court invented a distinction in terms of First Amendment law between contributions to candidates, which could be limited, and independent expenditures that by law were protected by the First Amendment and could not be limited. This was a new distinction and I have to say, a largely unworkable distinction. Let me compare Baker versus Carr and Buckley versus Vallejo in several respects so you can see why, while Baker versus Carr was probably an appropriate exercise of judicial power, Buckley versus Vallejo was the farthest thing from it. First, both cases dealt with important real world problems. In Baker versus Carr, it was the malapportionment of the state legislatures and to some degree the National Congress. 
in Buckley's versus Vallejo, it was campaign finance that had produced, among other things, some of the sum of the abuses in Watergate. Think of the money in Maurice Stan's safe and so on. The great difference, however, is that in Baker versus Carr, the problem could not be solved realistically by any other body than the United States Supreme Court. In Buckley versus Vallejo, the problem had already been solved. It had been solved by Congress. The problem was the Supreme Court didn't like the solution. So it resolved the problem. There'd been a long lead up to Baker versus Carr, as I had described to you, both in the sense of the steady migration and in the Supreme Court's prior acquaintance with the problem. There was essentially no lead up to Buckley versus Vallejo. There was a fair amount of political sophistication on the court that decided Baker versus Carr. I mentioned Chief Justice Warren and Justice Black. There was virtually none of that real world I ran for office political sophistication on the court by 1976. The only member of that court who had ever run for political office was Justice Powell, who had served on the Richmond School Board. All of the rest of them were, I'll say it this way, political naives. And their naivete showed in the distinction they drew. The distinction between political contributions to candidates that in their view showed the possibility of undue influence and corruption and independent expenditures not coordinated with the candidates that in their view did not carry with it the same dangers of corruption or appearance of corruption or undue influence has proved in practice to be largely, I might say, might say entirely unworkable. I think any practicing politician could have told them that. Uh, and we are now living in a world still where we are forced to abide by that distinction, unrealistic as it is, and to the degree that there's any pressure to abolish the distinction, <laughs> the pressure is coming from those justices on the court who would seek to have no limitations on contributions, just as they now have no limitation on expenditures. So I would call the court in 1976, at the time Buckley was decided, politically naive. I hesitate to attach the same label to the current court as it elaborates on what Buckley versus Vallejo began. Finally, let's come back to the principles that underlie the two cases. The principle in Baker versus Carr, one person, one vote, is probably the most important principle of a democracy. It is an important and true principle, one that Chief Justice Warren regarded so highly, he wrote in his autobiography, that he regarded Baker versus Carr as the most important case decided during his tenure as Chief Justice. Well, that sounds right until you remember that they also decided Brown versus Board of Education during his tenure. <laughs> But as a political matter, he regarded one person, one vote as such an important core principle that it could carry the day. Well, what is the principle? What's the simplification, the principle that we necessarily end up with with judge-made law that justifies Buckley versus Vallejo? I can hardly call it a principle. I'll call it a principle in quotations. Money equals speech. Now, of course, that's wrong. We all know money does not equal speech. But that's what Buckley versus Vallejo told us. Money influences speech. In fact, it often influences speech to a great degree. It gives unequal influence in speech. But to say money is speech is a profound and distorting simplification. Buckley versus Vallejo also made room only for that single principle or idea. It put to one side as not worthy of consideration principles that we also instinctively understand as relevant to fair education, or fair, excuse me, fair uh, politics. Think back to, I'm thinking of that book about everything I needed to learn about the world I learned in kindergarten. Don't go back so far. Go back to the fourth grade. 
when the teacher says, anyone wishing to run for president of the class may use construction paper of a certain size and may spend no more than $1.50 on materials. Now, is that fair? We tend to think so. Now, of course, I recognize that there are lots of problems if the only thing we have in our campaign finance law is a notion of equality. That cannot be a completely governing principle either, but it should not be irrelevant. The court has treated it as irrelevant. How about another principle that has shown up in the implementation? The court has given us a, almost a complete principle, corporations are people. That's the foundation idea for Citizens United. The court tells us just as people cannot be limited in their independent expenditures, corporations, because they are people, cannot be limited constitutionally in their independent expenditures. That, of course, is another false principle. Of course, corporations are not people. They are artificial persons. We've got all kinds of vocabulary to discuss the ways in which they are treated as if they were, but they are artificial creations. Think for just a moment about the constitutional principle that the court has given us, that because corporations are people, their independent expenditures of money on campaign finance cannot be limited. Pretend you are a legislator in Delaware and ignore the politics for the moment. You are drafting a new set of corporate charter laws and corporate law from here forward in Delaware says any Delaware corporation is forbidden to give money to political campaigns. Is that an unconstitutional statute for Delaware corporations? I think absolutely not. I mean, it is an artificial creation by the state of Delaware for particular purposes, and there is nothing in my mind that the state of Delaware is doing wrong to say that a for-profit corporation is not allowed to give money to political campaigns. So. Where has, so where has this come from? Again, it's a radical simplification of the idea money is speech, corporations are principles. Another principle that has been foregone is the Brandeis principle that we saw in New State Ice versus Liebman. The states are laboratories, <clears throat> laboratories for democracy. The court has consistently, in recent years, insisted that the state campaign finance law must conform to the federal First Amendment campaign finance law that the court has articulated. I'll give you only two examples. First one of 2011. In Arizona, there was a statute that tried to, to give some implementation of the equality principle, so that there would be matching funds for certain candidates if the other side was outspending to too great a degree. The court promptly struck it down. In 2012, Montana had its limitation on corporate finance, corporate expenditures in local litigation, local, local elections struck down, so that not only has the court given us these quasi-principles carried them out to this degree, it has forbidden the states from acting in their traditional function as laboratories for democracy to give us a different vision as to how this might be done. There is no obviously right answer to campaign finance. The right answer as best we can come to it, or the cluster of permissibly right answers as best we can come to it, I think are necessarily going to be answers based on some form of competing ideas, practicality, expedience, and compromise. That is to say, the sorts of rules you get out of legislatures rather than out of courts. We are now in a situation where I think we are, I'll say it a little more cautiously than Justice Brandeis was alleged to have said it. I will say that a society with a, with a high concentration of wealth is not a society, uh, is a society that will have difficulty in maintaining its democracy. Further, a society that goes out of its way to allow these wealthy to have a greatly disproportionate influence on its politics will have an even greater difficulty in maintaining its democracy. I hope that we can eventually come to a better solution. But the court has constitutionalized 
its solution under the First Amendment. This means, unfortunately, that the body to which we must look for its solution is the very body that has created the problem. Thank you. Let me just say that uh, my hopes, which were high, have been exceeded. Uh, I should have known, Willie, uh, the high level at which you were going to speak to us when I saw that both your wife and the father-in-law of your daughter came to listen to you, uh, which sort of said something to me. I, I am reminded by putting together Gerhardt's comments and yours, Willie, that we are, after all, a law reform organization. And... Uh, Sometimes I think, Ricky, we need to have a discussion about how we might be productive in at least having discussions in this area. We've seen in some of the things we've done in recent years, Lance has done a great job of putting together a diverse group of people just to have conversations, and from those conversations, other things have happened. And I think after listening to Willie we need to have a serious discussion about whether there's any role at all for us in the campaign finance area because there's nothing, I agree, more key to the success of our democracy than looking at that in a serious way. So having said that, let us adjourn and continue to talk about the first peoples that were here. Thank you. Thank you.